Nissan. Nissan, Nissan. Oh, the volume control is there or here? Okay, uh, let's wait for two more minutes. Can you hear me back there? Here, can you hear me? As a, yes, okay. I'll just wait for a couple of minutes. It's still uh, two minutes for 5.30. That's great. Wonderful. There's nothing like. Now it will be. Huh? Yeah, but now if body is closed, clean, it will become wet. Let it be like that. Okay. Uh, I think you can get started. So let's first uh, my uh, starting point from the second lecture onwards is always recall. Okay. Uh, so our main has aim in the course will be to study functions. Okay. So. functions from one set to the other set B. All the things we are interested are in a general sense fall in this problem. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me first recall what all we introduced. Uh, it's made up, there are three important pieces one the domain set A, two, the codomain set, that is the value set, where the values are, and third, the rule, whatever, the rule of association which takes A to F of. Basically, therefore, there are three pieces in a function, three components in this gadget called a function. Now, how good each one of these gadgets are, what structures each one of these gadgets made up of, gives the various properties of the function. Okay? In other words, what sort of structures that the domain set A have, it may be raw set, it may be a vector space, it may be a topological space, whatever thing is, depending on what sort of structure does this set A have, what sort of structure does this have, is it a real valued function, is it an integer valued function, is it a vector valued function, is it a set valued function, what sort of a function is it. So that's another piece which can have its own structures. and how good is this rule of associating one to the other with respect to these two structures? So all these are going to make how good uh, that gadget is going to be and what sort of information we can extract out of such a gadget, what all we can say about such a function. So you may see that there are three pieces, two of them are sets. 
and one of them is some kind of combining these two sets from one to the other. So therefore, we will first look at something about sex, structure about sex. That is what we started, okay. Something about the structure of sex. That will be the first part that we will be discussing. And uh, as you all know, set theory is a very dangerous subject to study in a very rigorous manner. You get sucked into it and then uh, there is no way you escape. You are into a black hole. You from one paper to another book to another paper to another book, you never come out of it. And uh, so what we will do is, we will be very bold to be uh, cowards. That we will not uh, ever attempt to do too much rigorous things about set, set theory. We will just state a few facts, look at a few facts here and there which we will use. Okay. Anything uh, uh, in the first attempt, any uh, first attempt to read set theory in all its rigor will be a disaster. Okay. Uh, of course, computer scientists uh, will definitely need to read because there is enough logic in it. Mathematical logic plays a major role in the abstract theory of sets. Okay, so our first uh, basic uh, part of the course will be very quickly to review certain aspects of sets that we would use. It is not that it is all of them or anything like that. Some of them which we would use and in a very intuitive heuristic manner. Okay. All right, so that is the uh, way we are going to, that is the first part of the course, that is to study these two pieces, what kind of structures we can impose on these two pieces, etc., etc. And then the next part will be the real analysis, where we look at what sort of functions we are going to look at. Okay, uh, continuing with this, so the main study is the structure and analysis of F obtained from the structures of A, B and the root. Each one of them will play a role in deciding how that function is. Okay. So you change, the components are different, the machine that you are going to get is different. Okay. And the components are weak, then the, the machine is weak, the function is weak. Okay, so this is what our main uh, goal will be. Okay. Uh, the first part is A and B, and the second part is the rule, and then the third part is what sort of things we get out of such fellows. Right. Uh, I will even recall a few more things that I did. And for such a function, uh, we say 1, f is 1, 1, if a1, a2 are in the domain, a1 not equal to a2 implies f of a1 is not equal to a1. Different distinct fellows are coded distinctly. That is what is 1, 1 means. Then we define the notion of the range of f. It is the set of all values taken by the function. Then we had the notion that f is on to if the range of f is all of B. And we called it an isomorphism if it is both 1, 1 and 1, 2. So F is an isomorphism if it is both 1, 1 and 1, 2.
So, these are some of the uh, uh, simple things that we looked at. So, now what we are going to look at is the notion of equivalence of two sets. This also we introduced last time. Then we say a set A is equivalent to a set B if there exists an isomorphism from A to B. That is, if there exists F, a function from A to B, which is 1, 1 and on 2. Then we write A is equivalent to B. That is the standard notation for equivalence. So, okay, first of all, let me, uh, as everybody knows, whenever you see such a thing, we know that A is equivalent to A, the identity map is the 1, 1 on 2 function from A to A. And then if we have A is equivalent to B, then B is equivalent to A. The inverse map is the other side on 2, 1, 1 on 2. And the composition map will give you A is equivalent to C. Okay. So, this is the standard property of equivalence. Now, basically what does uh, equivalence intuitively tell us? It is something says that these two sets are of the same size. Whatever the word size means. Suppose you, you can say that it can take, you can take a 1 kg of rice and 1 kg of sugar. You may say that is rice, this is sugar. But both are 1 kg. So that size, that weight, they are same. It may be sugar, it may be uh, coal or whatever, it does not matter. From the point of view of that kg weight, they are equivalent, they are same. So, there is a notion therefore of sameness of size which we are going to introduce through equivalence. If two sets are equivalent, they are said to have the same size and therefore we can, if we know the size of one, we know the size of all the fellows who are equivalent to that particular set we call that size as the cardinality. Okay, so, it is not it is not just that set, but that set represents something. It is a concrete realization of something. One kg of rice is a concrete realization of the abstract concept one kg. One kg of sugar is also a concrete realization of the abstract concept of one kg. But if you say what is one kg? That is a very abstract definition. Okay. So, similarly, therefore, we will call this as the cardinality. Okay. Uh, every set defines a size. So, if I take a bag, I do not know how much it is, but it defines some weight. So, every set therefore defines a size, which I call as size. Okay. And two sets equivalent or said to have the same size. Okay. These are all very intuitive still. So, uh, there are the problem here is if you want to get, uh, try to do this too formally, we get into all kinds of paradoxes like the set of all sets and we cannot define an equivalence class and all problems. Okay. So, uh, we will do it very vaguely and rather intuitively. Two sets equivalent are set of the same size. We denote the size, the size defined by a set A by like a like mod A. Okay. And what we have therefore is A is equivalent to B, then the size of A is the same as the size of B. 
So for that abstract concept, we can take A either as a representative or B as a representative or anybody equivalent to that as a representative, a concrete representative of that abstract concept of size. Okay. Um, suppose I give two sets. I want to know whether they are equivalent, right? Then what should we do? The only way we can decide whether a set A is equivalent to a set B is to produce that 1 1 on 2 map from A to B, okay? So whenever we have to decide on the fact whether a set A is equivalent to a set B, the onus is on you to produce that function from A to B, which is 1, 1 and on 2, and which is never an easy job. It's always a uh, very hard thing to generate such a function, which is 1, 1 and on 2 between two sets, okay. So let me write this. In order to verify whether A is equivalent to B, see if you if you if you if you give me two bags, one consisting of rice, the other consisting of sugar, if you want to verify whether they are the same bag, I can lift them and see. You have to give me some scale on which I can put, or even some place where I can balance both and then verify. Without knowing how much is the weight, I can still verify because they balance each other, okay. So that sort of thing we want to do. It's even that if in order to verify whether A is equivalent to B, we have to find a 1, 1 onto function F from A to B. Never easy. This is never easy. Whenever something is not easy, it's interesting. Okay. I read uh, several years back a, a book on classical analysis by Einar Hille. He had some very beautiful books written if you go to library. I don't think whether anybody goes to library these days. Everything is online. But there are some books on which you should read. Einar Hille had a book on some topics in classical analysis. One of the chapters was title divergent series so before bill before he started a chapter he used to write two lines something interesting he, his uh, comment was about one of the mathematicians i think abel this series is divergent good that i can do something interesting with this that means if you had given me a convergent series there is nothing interesting there is no challenge in that okay similarly when something is not easy some challenge comes so, we are going to look at some way of surmounting. This is uh, coming out of this uh, tricky situation and try to see how one can uh, verify whether some two sets are equivalent by a slightly uh, more comfortable way. Okay. Uh, let's say, so okay, so towards this end, uh, we'll look at the following. Suppose A and B are two sets. Think of them as two boxes, okay. I have two boxes, A is, there are certain things I can load and completely, that's what packing box A means. All those elements pack that box A. And similarly, there are these elements in box B. Now, suppose I can take all the elements in the, I empty the box B, say for a moment, and take all the elements of the box A and somehow fit them into box B. When I fit, I may still have some open space left, etc. The only thing I look at is, can I put all these things in this? Suppose I can empty this box A and put everything in box B, 
that means box B is at least as big as box A. When, when a size wise, you may say measurement is that is different, this length is more, etc. When I say this can be fitted into this in that sense of the size, the box B will be at least as big as this. And reverse way, suppose I can take everything in B and put it into A. Maybe with some space of A is left out, I don't care. If everything in B can be put into A, then A will be at least as big as B intuitively. So, in that case, if everything in this can be put into that, if everything in this can be put into this, what happens? We can say the two sets, the two boxes are of the same size. And that exactly is what uh, is a theorem. You see, the simple common sense uh, idea is a theorem in set theory called the Schroeder Bernstein's theorem. That's the how uh, uh, the equivalence is proved generally. Okay. So, given, given A, B, two sets, there are four possibilities. That is, four, two boxes, say. There are four possibilities. One, everything in A can be packed in everything in, in B. What does that mean in set theoretic language? For every element of A, I find a space to put in box B. That means there is a map from A to where? To some part of B because I may not be occupying all the place of B. So, a subset of B1 which may or may be equal to B, which is 1, 1 and 1, 2. I will rewrite this which is 1, 1 and 1, 2. Now, how can I say this in short, short language? A is equivalent to a subset of B. So, I will write this as A is equivalent to a subset of B. And B is equivalent to a subset of A. That is everything in A can be packed into B and everything in B can be packed into A. The other possibility is everything in A can be packed into B. That is A is equivalent to a subset of B. But B cannot be packed. B is not equivalent to any subset of A. There is no way that you can pack B into A. What is the third alternative? A is not equivalent to any subset of B. That is A cannot be packed in B. But B is possible to pack. Pardon me? This one? It is not any subset. That is, you have no way, whichever way you try to place the box elements, they are not going to be able to be filled. Even if there exists one subset to which it is equivalent, then it reduces to the first case. In the first case, what we are saying is, A is equivalent to a subset of B and B is equivalent to a subset of A. Now, in this, we are saying A is equivalent to a subset of B. This does not happen. What does this does not happen mean? B cannot be equivalent to any subset of A. That is, yes, 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 no, no, yes. What is the last alternative? No, no. Okay. So, for A is not equivalent to any subset of B and B is not equivalent to any subset of A. These are the four possibilities intuitively. Okay. I mean, what we can think of. Right. But if we they are thinking in terms of boxes, does the fourth alternative 
it creates confusion, right? It does, this cannot happen. It should be possible to put this into this uh, or that into this. Okay. And same thing happens in set theory. It's hard to prove. It's not easy to prove. That four option is not possible in the general set theoretic language. It's not easy to prove. Okay. But it is true. Okay. So it can be shown. See, this is a very beautiful uh, phrase which I will often use. That means I don't want to show, best, I mean, not, I don't have the time to show. It can be shown. That means, uh, as if I pretend I can, but I don't have the time. It can be shown that the fourth alternative is not possible. It does not occur. So, we will remove this. So these are the three possibilities that exist. Now, what we, our intuition says is, in the first possibility, both A and B must be of the same size. That means there must be a 1, 1, on 2 map from A to B and that is for Schroeder-Bernstein. You give me a 1, 1, on 2 map from A to a subset, you can give me a 1, 1, on 2 map from B to a subset, I will produce a 1, 1, on 2 map from A to B and therefore equivalent. So, the Schroeder-Bernstein's theorem says, in fact, it is a very interesting proof. It says, 1 implies A is equal to B. The proof uh, is a very interesting uh, uh, proof. It is almost uh, trying to, uh, the, in fact, the language used, the words used are also like this. It is like take a human being and start tracing his ancestry. Who was his father, who was his grandfather, who was his great-grandfather. At some stage, you find that somebody who does not have an ancestor. So, then we say Rishi Moolam and Nadi Moolam, you do not ask. You reach, that, that sort of ideas are used uh, to give a proof of it. A very interesting proof, I would suggest that if you are interested, you look at this book. That is, I think, uh, nicely, sim, simple, simply, like G. Sim, Simmons, what is it called? Topology and Modern Analysis. You see. This is one good reference. <coughs> That one implies A is equivalent to B. And this is the idea that, so in fact, the basically tracing the ancestors eventually tells you how to construct that 1 1 on 2 map from A to B using these two maps. So, what does one say? I have one function from A to a subset of B1, B, which is 1 1 and on 2. I have another function G which is a 1, 1, on 2 function from B to a subset of A1. Using this F and G, I will construct an H, which is a function from A to B, which is 1, 1 and 1, 2. Okay. So, that is, uh, let me not uh, labor on that point more. So, that is the theorem, uh, which invariably used uh, you in proving two sets are equivalent. Never one produces directly the 1, 1, on 2 map. Okay, so we will always be using this concept, uh, this way of proving most of the time uh, two sets are equivalent. Okay. Now I will introduce uh, two simple notions, finite and infinite sets. All these make a difference depending on how the set A is how the set B is in that function definition, whether it is finite, whether it is infinite, 
or how that function behaves on certain finite set, how that rule behaves on certain infinite set, all these have a bearing in building the full character of the function. Okay, so again, um, um, in a sense, I'll cheat. We are assuming that we know what uh, integers are. We know what positive natural numbers are. We all know what integers are. And if we don't know, don't tell. And say that I know it. Okay, so um, of course, one has to define carefully, uh, for, formally, what integers are through Peano's axiom, induction, etc., etc., whichever language you want to use properly. So let's assume that uh, we all know the full set of natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., etc., that the infinite set. So we say the set, consider this set 1, 2, 3, n for some n. So let n be a positive integer, positive integer, and look at this set 1, 2, n. Okay, for the time being, call it a C. Well, intuitively, you know, we say that the size of this set is n. There are n apples in this. Okay, you have apple 1, apple 2, apple 3, apple n. And so, this there are n questions in this question paper. So, intuitively, we say this set has size n. Okay, so we denote this size by a n, n. So, any set which is equivalent to this set will also have size n. Okay, so therefore, whether uh, 10 apples or 10 donkeys or 10 monkeys, set theoretically, they are all the same. They are concrete realizations of an abstract concept called 10. The abstract concept is there. I am not able to visualize it. Every time I want to, I pu pull it down to a concrete realization of some set which represents that cardinality. Okay. Uh, so, any set a set is said to be a set X is said to be a finite set if there exists a positive integer n such that X is equivalent to that. For some positive integer n, X is equivalent to 1 to n. And not uh, oh, too much involved in this. And the set is said to be infinite if it is not finite. The, the, the name itself is negative. Infinite, it is not finite. Okay, if it is not finite, it is said to be infinite. Okay. That means we cannot find a positive integer n such that x is equivalent to. So, x is said to be infinite um, again slightly intuitive only infinite if x is not finite. For example, if you take n to be the set of all natural numbers. We say what is meant by all natural numbers, that is where the Peano's axiom for there is a starting point 1, for every n there is an n plus 1, for every n there is a successor and so on and so forth. So, uh, that is, uh, I will not get into the definition of the, maybe at a little later stage, I may come back to certain formal formalisms about these things. At that moment, let us take it intuitively. This is an infinite set. So, at least one infinite set we know. Okay. And anything equivalent to this is also an infinite set. Uh, now we will give a tricky definition. Okay. A set X is said to be countably infinite Now, these notions are very important in the analysis okay, in the, of a function. Uh, certain sets being countably infinite will give you certain nice results and so on and so forth. The set X is said to be countably infinite if X is equivalent to n. Which is the same thing as saying that is 
n is equal unto x. Both are same. When I say x is equal unto n, n is also equal unto x. So, if a set is uh, said to be countably infinite, what does that really mean? What is, say so let us say you see n is equivalent to x means what? Here is n, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. are here. Here is x. So, there is a 1, 1 onto map which takes the set n to x. So, I will call it as x1, this as x2, this as x3 or f1, f2, this is the function f, f3 and so on. So, that says now we will be by doing by this function f is on 2 also. So, it exhausts everything. That means the elements of the set x can be written in the form of a sequence f1, f2, f3. In fact, that is the definition of a sequence. It is a function from n to that set. Okay. So, that is what really means by saying that a set is countably infinite. Now, when you okay, uh, when you go from finite to infinite, always something crazy happens. Okay. When you go from a finite dimensional vector space to infinite dimensional vector space, there are problems, problems, challenges. The definition, okay. Suppose x is any set. Let me put this, let's say any, so b is any set, okay. By a sequence of elements in b, we mean a function f from um, n to b, okay. Then fj is called the jth element of the sequence. So therefore, if b is real numbers, then you get a sequence of real numbers. If b is matrices, collection of matrices, you get a sequence of matrices. If B is uh, uh, themselves some functions, then you get a sequence of functions and so on and so forth. So, a formal definition of a sequence of sequence of real numbers means a, ma a mapping from n, a function from n to the real numbers. A sequence of complex numbers means a function from n to the complex numbers and so on. And the value of the function at j is called the jth term of that sequence and usually we write it as fj or xj or nj or whatever it is we want, okay. No, I am not saying that at all. I'm not, if it is on to it is going to be countably infinite, okay. Okay. Um, let us take for example, uh, the set n itself, which is 1, 2, 3, etc. And then let us take the set x, which consists of only the odd numbers, okay. Then you will find that I can define a function from n to x as f of n is equal to 2 n minus 1. Suppose I define a function like that. What, is, what happens to that function? 1 is mapped to 1, 2 is mapped to 3, 3 is mapped to 5, 4 is mapped to 7 and so on and so forth. So, I have a nice 1 to 1 onto map and therefore, these two sets are equivalent. So, therefore, the size of n, so n is equivalent to, okay. So, one, this is 1, 1 on 2. So, the size of n is the same as size of this x. So, what happened therefore is, even though I removed infinite number of things from this set, it still remains the same. The size remains the 
same, which is crazy. Okay, that's what the problem that arises with. You remove infinite things from infinity, still it remains infinite. And the same infinite, same size. There is no change in the size at all. It's only relabeling that has been done. So we have to be very careful when we deal with infinite sets that just because we removed a few things, it doesn't mean we have reduced the size. We may still be hanging around with the same amount of problem. Okay. So now we, we first introduce a notation. Okay. The size determined by the natural numbers is denoted by Aleph naught. This is the first letter in Hebrew alphabet. Uh, they say alpha, then alphabet, and then Aleph, they are all same. And the suffix n, zero means there is going to be more headache. There is going to be an Aleph 1, Aleph 2, Aleph 3, and things like that. So that problem will be there. Okay. But anyway, for us, this Aleph naught is very, very important. Okay, so that is the first. Uh, I will not say, I, at the moment I will not say. So we have seen what is a finite set and infinite set. And we know one infinite set, namely the set of all natural numbers. And we call uh, the size of n as Aleph naught. Now we may ask, is, well, if two sets are infinite, they have the same size, both are infinite. But it does is not so. In the language of the size that we have determined, there are different sizes of infinity. Okay, so that's the next step that we want to see. And these are all important facts that will go into the study. So eventually, therefore, in the, the way formally we define the real number, this is the smallest infinity we can think of, the natural numbers, the LF naught. Okay. So the question. Uh, since you are saying countably infinity, are there uncountably infinite sets also? So, question. Are there, and um, I will give some constructions which are important in the next class, uh, somewhere, somewhere in one of the classes. Are there uncountably infinite sets. So what does this question ask? I want an infinite set, but it should not be countably infinite. That means it should not be equivalent to n. So I want an infinite set which is not equivalent to n. Okay. I am looking for the answer to the question, whether I can construct an infinite set which is not equivalent to n. And to this end, we will show, well, you can do much more than that. Okay. Um, so what we are going to do is, uh, we observe some simple properties of infinite set first. Let me see whether I, I, should, I should finish this today. Um, so let me intuit again. Uh, there are lots of logical questions here, uh, which uh, I just gloss over. I don't even uh, dare to mention these things. There is a very interesting book uh, called, uh, in, in, in the form of a comical strip, uh, comic strips. The whole book is in the form of comic strips. Okay, uh, this that goes through beautifully uh, with a, by the time. Uh, it, by the time you read, you three, you've gone through every problem that logicians faced. Uh, right up the Godel's incompleteness theorem is in that book. Has anybody seen that book? But I don't remember the author. Uh, the title of the book is Logico Mix. Logic comics sort of thing. Okay, so maybe I don't know whether last is X or C. It's in the in the form of comic strips. It goes through everybody's work and Frankel, Purity, um, anybody for the Godel, Hilbert, and Cantor and whatnot. Very nice, interesting book to read. You can probably Google it and find out. Okay, 
must be there. I suppose it's there in the computer science department library. If not, get one. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Going back to X and N. Yes. No, subset has a different meaning. See, X may contain 10 apples and N may contain 10 dogs, but they are equivalent. It doesn't mean I, uh, the X has, uh, is a subset of dogs. Okay, so equal, the idea of subsets is very specific, element specific. The idea of a sub subset, the definition is element specific. This element is there, this element is there. The idea of uh, this equivalence is size specific. It has nothing to do with the who is there, but how many are there, what is the size. That, so the, the notion of this uh, cardinality is size specific, not element specific. But the notion of subset is very specifically elements have to come into the picture. Okay. Same answer again. 10 dog, a set with 10 dogs is equal to a set with 10 donkeys. But neither of them is a subset of the other equivalent sets. <coughs> they are not subsets of each other. Okay. So, uh, that's what I mean. The notion of, if you want to use the word subset, then you are going to be very particular about who is there. Whether it is sugar or rice. But when I am talking about kg, I am not bothered about whether rice or sugar is there. That bag is weighing 1 kg. That's what is important. Okay. That, that's what is the difference between the, the when, when you are talking about subsets and we are talking about uh, this notion of size. Okay, so when I say x is equivalent to y, it doesn't mean x is a subset of y. I don't mean y is a subset of x. I don't mean any of these things. All I mean is there is a function. This whole thing may be very abstract. That may be very concrete. It doesn't matter at all. Pardon me? Yes. Yes, obviously. That's the property that I am going to come now. Okay. And I say now I am going to talk about a property of two infinite sets. One of the characteristic properties of infinite sets is every infinite set will be equivalent to one of its proper subsets. No finite set can be equivalent to a proper subset. Whereas every infinite set must necessarily be equivalent to one of its subsets. It does not mean all those which are equivalent to them are in the subset. One of the subsets must be equivalent. That's what. So, what we are trying to say, see, let me point out this. X is infinite set. So, what I want to now show is there exists a proper subset of x, say x1. What do I mean by proper subset? It is contained in it, but there are some things which are in x which are not in x1. So, it is a part of x. Under a definite part of X, there are certain pieces in X which are not in X1. So, it is a proper subset of X1, X, such that X is equivalent to X1. This is what we want to show. This does not mean, what you have in mind, this does not mean That if x is infinite set and y is equivalent to x, 
then y is a subset of x. All I am saying there is at least one subset which is equivalent to x. Whenever x is infinite, there is at least one subset which is equivalent to x. So the property of the infinite sets is you can remove some things and still it will have the same size. That is what essentially the characteristic of infinite sets. You can remove some things and still maintain the same size. And that is what we did in the odd. We had the natural numbers, we removed some things, namely the even numbers and still maintain the same size. This does not mean that anybody else who has the same size has been obtained by removing something from here. Okay, That is one way of getting equivalent. But there are others who are nothing to do with this set as far as elements are concerned, but still have the same size. Okay, is that clear? Okay, now this part I want to intuitively tell you how this happens. And this is very tricky. I mean, the same that you, logically there are a lot of things uh, that are that are gaps in that argument because more axioms are needed, etc., etc. And I will wind up uh, at some stage of that time the discuss, this discussion with uh, uh, what are all the logical questions. Okay. So let us say this is the infinite set. That is the given infinite set. What is my goal? Eventually, I must get hold of a subset, proper subset, such that x is equivalent to x1. So, given the set x, I want to get hold of a smaller piece, smaller in the sense that subset, not in the sense of size, which is same size as the other. See the, eventually in the end, if I remember and if I had done enough of, of this analysis, I will give you some examples to show small, big, all have no meaning. It depends on the context. It depends on what do you mean by size. Depending on what you call as size, something could be small. But in another context of size, it will be big. So small and so the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So smallness and bigness are in the eyes of the beholder. Okay, that means how do you see them? In what in in what context are you seeing them? Depending on that, something is big or small. Okay. Okay. So now we are talking in terms of set theoretic small and big. Okay. Right. Um, so first of all, let us look at the set X. I am going to do first one thing. Uh, okay. Let me do this and then uh, write down the result. This is an infinite set. What am I given? I am given an infinite set. So, I will choose somebody from that set. There are many fellows there. I will choose one fellow. Now, this was simply blasted and thrashed by the logicians. What do you mean by choose? Then they had to put an axiom called axiom of choice. <laughs> okay, I will put it there. Okay, I can choose. Okay, that's I can choose is the axiom. Okay. Without that, they could not uh, uh, proceed. Logicians are crazy guys. Okay. Uh, if you get uh, most of the logicians were thought they were mad, people thought they were mad. Okay, if you read this book, you will see that. Okay, how, how things happen, and they, they were they were crazy in the sense they were different from others. Godel, for example, died because of malnutrition in the sense he never used to eat, always used to think about the problems, and he never probably never even remembered to eat. And eventually died of whatever that uh, disease called, and complete uh, this thing, lack of nutrition. Einstein, they used to tell a story that when he used, when they were walking on the uh, campus of Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies, and uh, some students uh, suddenly stopped him and said, uh, "Professor, I want to ask you a question." Then uh, they discussed. Then suddenly they got into a discussion for 15 minutes. Then the matter was over. And the boy said, thank you, professor. Then he said, just a moment. And then uh, he asked the student, when you stopped me, in which direction I was going? 
<laughs> and the student said, sir, you are heading that side. Oh, that means I have finished my lunch. And he walked towards the department. He didn't even know whether I finished or what he was doing. Okay. So the, the direction was that towards the office. That means I must be coming from the canteen. That was that. These were the sort of uh, fellows, and uh, this they were 24 by 7 scientists. Okay, not uh, luckily they were not the 24 by 7 news channels. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there is an element. So what we do is pick an x1 in x. Okay. Then look at the set obtained by removing this fellow. So I made a hole there. Take a pin and punch the hole and that point is removed. That I have taken in my control. The remaining still has how many? Still is infinite. Okay. So the remaining set, because if it were finite, the remaining were finite. So finite plus one will be finite. The original set will become finite. So therefore, because the original set was infinite, by removing one, I have got still an infinite set. So now I pick an x2 from x minus x1. Now by induction, if I have picked x1, x2, xk, then I will pick xk plus 1 from x minus x1, x2, xk. Okay, so having picked x1, x2, xk, pick xk plus 1 from x minus, x minus x1, x2, xk is still infinite. Why? Because I have removed only finite number of things. So now what? By induction, I would have got x1, x2, x3, x4, etc, etc, a sequence. And therefore, any sequence is a countably infinite set. It is equivalent to m. So therefore, we get a Countably infinite subset x1, x2, x3, etc. So, the moral of the story is every infinite set must contain a countably infinite subset. Every infinite set possesses a countably infinite subset. So, let us note that fact. This is a this this is a uh, result uh, which is uh, dependent on the axiom of choice, which uh, uh, we will uh, try to use and try to prove the continuum hypothesis. Anyway, I'll I'll come to that shortly. So, fact one: every infinite set has a countably infinite subset. Okay. That is the first fact. Every infinite set, that is one of the character, one of the important properties of infinite sets. Every infinite set must possess a countably infinite subset. The, now we look at this following. Okay. I am given the set X. So now I have got that countably infinite subset. I will call it as x1 and I will call it as the remaining part as some x2. Okay, so now the set, given an infinite set, I can divide it into two parts. One part is x1 that you, ex, I, you can extract any countably infinite set you want. You are guaranteed there is one. You choose whichever countably infinite set you want, subset you want, call it x1, call the remaining part as x2. Okay. Now look at x. Okay, this is x1. Now what does x1 consist of? It consists of a sequence of elements because x1 is a countably infinite set. So I have x1 consists of x1, x2, etc, etc. Here again, x1, x2, etc. Now, 
Now what I do is, I separate it into two parts. I will put the A x1 here and take the remaining fellows. So the x1 itself has been divided into two parts. So x2 is here, that x1 part has been split into two parts. One, where x1 I have taken away and the remaining x2, x3, etc. Now I define a map x1 goes to x2, x2 goes to x3 and so on and in x2 every element goes to itself. So what is that? Define, so let x1, uh, ha, 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 too many x1s, okay, let, uh, what is this theorem? Subset, so let call this as x hat. So let x hat be equal to x minus x1. Remove from x the point x1. Then define f mapping x to x hat as f of xj is equal to xj plus 1 if xj belongs to x1 and f of a equal to A if A belongs to X2. In the lower part, nothing, no change is takes place. In the other part, they just shift one place. This is called the Hilbert Hotel, okay. See, the, the, they call the, the hotel had an infinite number of rooms, countably infinite number of rooms. All rooms were occupied. New guests arrives. They simply ask every room fellow to move to the adjacent room. And then the first room became vacant. That's uh, that's that's exactly what uh, accountably infinite means. Let's call the Hilbert Hotel problem. Okay. Anyway. So now what happened? This map maps x to x hat. It is one one and one two. Every element has a unique identity. They are one one. Nothing there. And everything in x hat is covered now. X two is covered. X three is covered. X four is covered. And this part is of course simply copied. So therefore, f is 1, 1, on 2. Therefore, x is equivalent to x hat. That's what I said. Every, the set x must be equivalent here. And x hat is a proper subset. Why it is a proper subset? That fellow x1 is not there. All other fellows is a subset because x hat is all this part. And it is a proper subset because that fellow is not there. So therefore, x is equivalent to a proper subset x hat. Because that is uh, one of the fundamental properties of uh, infinite sets. Every infinite set is equivalent to one of its proper subsets. It is a characterization of infinite Sometimes to prove something is infinite set, this is one way of showing, show that it is equivalent to a proper subset and therefore it must be infinite. Okay, so now uh, since I have uh, 6.30, I will make now a, a question which I will discuss in the next class. Oh. The question is, are there uncountably infinite Are there sets which are uncountably infinite? That is, they are infinite, but they are not equivalent to n. And the answer is yes, and that creates new, new arithmetic, new mathematics, etc., etc. Okay, so let me uh, first uh, two minutes, uh, two or three minutes, quickly uh, say a few things, uh, which I will do in detail later. Suppose I have a set X which has three elements, say 1, 2, 3. Okay. What about its power set? So the size of X is 3. What can you say about the size of 2 to the X? 2 to the power of 3. Good. It's 2 to the power of 3. So in general, if I have a size set with n elements, then 2 to the power of X has size. 2 to the n. 
Now it looks like the power set is more powerful than the original set as far as size is concerned. See, it goes on increasing exponentially. 2, then 2 square, then 2 cube, 2 to the power of 4, 2 to the power of 5, 2 to the power of n. So, we ask, suppose I take this set n and compare it with its power set. This is also infinite, this is also infinite, but if this logic works, that must be bigger. Right? And it is. It is bigger. What do we mean by bigger? Size is bigger. What do you mean by size is bigger? I can pack this in that, but I can't back, pack that in this. What does that mean? I can get a 1, 1 on 2 map from n to 2 to the power of n, but I cannot get 2 to the n equal to any subset of n. So, 2 to the n is bigger. Right? So, therefore, I got some infinity which is bigger than the countably infinity. So, I throw up my hands and say uncountably infinity. But then, if you have in the institute for long enough, if you link the chain of the 150th paper you wrote, it has some connection with the first paper you wrote. Okay, you keep on fiddling with the same idea in different formats. Okay. Now that I retired, I can say that. Okay. Now, they say then, okay, then I look at the power set of the power set. So that will be bigger than that. Oh, therefore, bigger, 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 we start getting a hierarchy of infinities, countably infinity, then the power set of the countable sets, then power set of the power set of the countably infinite sets. So we start getting a a uh, sequence of infinities. And so on. Okay. Now, as though this was not enough trouble, Cantor asked a question. Is there some infinity between this and this? <laughs> that is, is there a set A, which is not countably infinity, but smaller than the power set of n and nobody can prove it. That is called the continuum hypothesis, Cantor's continuum hypothesis. Say he assumed that there is no such thing. There cannot be any set which is bigger than the natural number that is uncountably infinity but smaller than the power set of 2 to the n. That is what? It is a size between these two infinite sizes and the answer is we do not know, nobody knows. So, let us say it is not there. Okay, So, that is what is the continuum hypothesis and this was a problem of big discussion whether just like in geometry there was the famous problem of parallel postulates, whether it can be proved using the other axioms. And then eventually they failed and they got non Euclidean geometries like Lobachevsky, Riemann, um, others. Similarly, in set theory, this question can we uh, prove this continuum hypothesis using the other axioms? And there was no success, just like the parallel postulate. And, uh, and then Gordel even tried to, the, the major axioms of set theory were the so called Zermelo Frankel system. And then put the axiom of choice also into it, and still uh, uh, Bedell was uh, not able to uh, prove it. He said he cannot. And then finally, roughly about 50 years ago, 1965, uh, Paul Cohen proved that just like in the case of parallel postulates in geometry, this continuum hypothesis is an independent axiom. It cannot be proved from the other axioms of the standard set theoretic setup. So, in other words, strictly speaking, you can have a set theory with continuum hypothesis, you can have a set theory without continuum hypothesis. Just like you can have Euclidean geometry with parallel postulate and non Euclidean geometry with no parallel postulate, 
you can have set theory, continuum set theory, continuum hypothesis set theory and non-continuum hypothesis set theory. The only warning is, if you are in non-continuum hypothesis set theory, you will be lonely. Uh, but you, the whole world is yours. You can prove any theorem you want. Only thing is, you have to start your own journal to publish them. There are no journals, you still publish. Okay. So everybody followed Cantor because it's useful. Whatever we do intuitively seem to fit into that. And uh, this, uh, uh, whatever we are doing today is conti with the with the assumption that of the continuum hypothesis. Okay, so it is still a hypothesis. So in the next lecture, I will explore these things a little bit more in detail. Okay, I'll stop here. Oh, by the way, uh, okay, I'll send a mail. <laughs>